1,000 the better stories. Welcome to 1,000 Better Stories, the Scottish Communities Climate Action Network's podcast sharing stories of community-led climate action in Scotland to help us all imagine a better and fairer future beyond the new normal and transform what we think is possible. Hi, it's Kashka, one of Scan's story weavers. Uh, Welcome to a slightly different format of our podcast. We decided to change things a little bit to give you more regular installments twice a month instead of the monthly and to vary the length of an episode a little to better fit into your listening day. I hope you enjoy this. So today we have a shorter 20 minute story from one of our mini grant recipients, Luke Winter, with music and production by Loris S. Sarid. Just a reminder that grants are available to anyone wanting to contribute content to the 1000 Better Stories podcast or to the blog. So please get in touch with myself or Joanna on stories at scottishcommunitiescan.org.uk to find out more. The application deadline for the next round is at the end of September, but we do consider proposals as soon as they come in. But now let's listen to Luke's stories of the land at Noidart Peninsula and how it's changed hands in recent history. He based this work on recordings he made during his summer travels a couple of years ago. Right, man, I hope you get this. Hope you're on WhatsApp. Um, so I'll do my best. From Jacobite times right back to the Act of Union, um, along with the Highland clearances, something the British government did would be just hand some of the Highlands to some English lord or some Scottish lord. You know, what, what like the British Empire does, just carves up the country, regardless of who lives there, and hands it to one of their pals. And um, the response to that was often, you know, Highlanders um, would take arms and raid the the new laird's house and try and take it back, or would just steal his shit, you know. Um, these land raids, they became known, um, started way back Jacobite times, but the last one in the country, I think, that I know of, um, was Noidart in the 19... 19- 20s or 30s um because the after world war one the british government was still doing that they were still giving chunks of land away um to whatever general or lord you know did something for them in the war and so this lord something or other guy came back to flanders went into retirement and you know the government would just give him an island or whatever. They gave Noid art to this guy, um, and without any consultation to anyone, you know, you know what the British are like. Um, and it got worse when, towards the 30s, the Nazis are starting to come to power in Germany, and this lord came out as a Nazi sympathiser, um, as a lot of the English aristocracy did at the time. Um, so a wee band of the locals said enough is enough and seven men took up arms and raided uh, raided Noidart and tried to take it back um, which obviously didn't quite work because by that point the British had set up the legal system and things but it did kind of put the the legality of Noidart the ownership of Noidart into kind of question for a long time Basically what happened is the rest of the 20th century, this huge campaign for the Noidart estate basically to get put back into um, local ownership. Um, And eventually, around, I think it was 1999, finally it was handed back to the community. And Noidart is now kind of community owned, which is awesome as fuck. And 
I think the best part of the story is one of those seven men that raided the land, he was still alive. So one of those guys that fought for it actually got to see it come back to the community. Ah, you should you should chat to people about it when you're up there. Um, get the full story. Um, what actually happened. Shape of Noida for the first time. What a land, what an improbable land <laughs> to get to play with. I was so, how long are you here for? I don't know, I'm just cutting about from my like, stay in Glasgow. All so right. I've just hit a wee holiday period. Yeah, good for you. Never been annoyed at Just exploring. That's it, that's the way to do it. What paradise we've got on our doorstep. I know, we came for a weekend for a day just to have a look. 34 years later, we're still here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. that's magic. Anyway, enjoy yourself. Thank you very okay, much. Mama. So, I'm on Noidot and I've kayaked in. Um, the only ways to get a Noidot are you can get a ferry from my league, a small ferry, or you need to walk in. So it's often billed as one of the most remote communities in, in Britain because uh, there's no road to it. So I've kayaked and I've left my kayak at the foot of a hill and I've gone off piste and yomped up this hill and then looked at the Munro once I'm on the shoulder of this hill. It's towering above me and it's such a hot day and I realise like there's no way I'm going to climb all the way up there today. So I come off the hill heading for the for the town in Varee, um, thinking that I'll get a meal in the pub that night. And the first people that I meet are dragging a stag behind them and... I reach their Land Rover at exactly the same time as they reach their Land Rover. They drop their stag, I drop my bag. We go down to the river and get a drink and then I start getting the crack with them. So I say, oh, I'm going to the pub. And they say, pub shot, it's a Wednesday. I was like, oh, I was hoping to get to me. They were like, none of the locals go to the pub. Landlord's an arsehole. So what's happened there is a really common story, which is an incomer who hadn't really got any links to the community has come in, bought the pub. And within a couple of years has barred all of the locals <laughs> and the only people that go to it are tourists. Uh, it's since changed hands and is now in community ownership, which is great news. But at the time, the community's response was to build uh, what they build as the table next to the pub. The table's basically a sesh shack, right? It's like a bus stop uh, made out of wood whose sole purpose is drinking. And there's a wee fire pit outside of it. And opposite it is the village shop, which sells a brilliant selection of cold refrigerated beers from local breweries. Um, it's the best idea in the world. So this gamekeeper and this stoker, they landed up there staggering at the landy. They said, right, meet us at the table tonight. Oh, by the way, it's pizza night if you get there before seven. And I watched the Land Rover drive off, standing there with my backpack, wondering what had stopped me from asking them for a lift. Because... I'm still like seven miles away. So after my wee walk, I get to Inveree and the village is a single row of terraced houses or cottages really. <laughs> you go into the village shop, you buy the beers and then you sit at the table and adjacent to this is the pub and the beer garden for the pub and true to the word, the only people who were drinking in the beer garden of the pub were some tourists. I sat at the table and chatted to these residents all night, didn't have my microphones on, and I can surmise the crack as follows. The residents of Noidot are delighted not to have to work for Tofts anymore. Throughout the Highlands, the history in the past recent history has been that you work for posh people, lads, people by estates, and you work for the lads and the ladies, and now the community can work for each other and themselves. And they took great delight in telling the stories about new moneyed people buying up estates and the heads of the household saying, oh, I think it, you'd do well to go up and introduce yourself early on. And they said, what? Well, I've got work for the next two years. I don't I don't need to bow to nobody, you know? <laughs> but the stalker uh, and, and the gameskeepers crack it was about deer control. Um, so they were saying that humans have been really unsuccessful in keeping the, be 
<laughs> the beer population. I have been the deer populations down across Scotland, and that is as an apex predator. Humans aren't aren't doing their jobs, and so both of these guys were in favour of bringing in the wild cat and mass deer calls, and we're saying that like when you've got more deer, you don't just have less trees and less regrowth of of indigenous woodlands. You've got an increase of ticks. And the tick population's getting out of control as well. And ticks are bad for humans because they carry Lyme disease. And I know at least two people my age who've got Lyme's disease that has proved a really debilitating condition. Oh, it's the white and turquoise beaches of the west coast. And the lumber in Humbar. And the diesel ferries. And the alarm shows are birds. The engine are opening up. And the hills. Fuzzy and clear on the horizons. And always the water's laughing. Turquoise and full of flickering shadows. I've seen dragonflies on the top of the mountain yesterday. So he went there and the bedroom wasn't tidy. So he fitted the carpet round his knickers, round his trousers, round his shoes. He cut it all out. He cut it all out. <laughs> what? <laughs> I thought it was brilliant. You kidding, did he? <laughs> John Disher, the carpet fitter. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, really imagine nice. him doing something like that. He's got that yeah, kind of sense of humour. Yeah, humour, but I thought it was kind of Water just pishes out of the side of the mountains here. Each one, you can see the way that the streams have cleaved into the sides, I made little valleys lined by trees. And that water is just coming out of a spring at the top of the mountain, filtering up under the rock and pishing at the side and not passing any industrialised pasture. Oh man, to be filling myself with litre after litre of this water is... Oh, when you drink the, and you eat of the place that you're at and you're exploring that landscape, you're, it's a way of coming into accord with it on a fundamental level. I sat around the fire and got some fucking tales, like tales of like Queen Elizabeth being up in Barrisdale with her two sons. And the sons had got pals, and one of the pals was like, one of the guys here was up singing songs and that with his dad uh, for the Queen's entertainment. And one of the one of the boys who was pals with the prince um, was like, so is the clans? Is there still quite a lot of rivalry between the clan? Is the clan rivalry still ongoing? <laughs> <laughs> and. I guess your man here was playing the pipes. So like, do all Scottish people learn the pipes as children? All Scottish boys need to learn the pipes as children. He was like, aye, we have a Peter and Theos. <laughs> it was down by the farm of Scotters, Lord Brockett walked one day, and he saw a sight that worried him far more than he could say. For the seven men of Noidot were doing what they'd planned. They had staked their claims and were digging drains on Brockett's private land. 
You bloody reds, Lord Brockett yelled. What's this you're doing here? It doesn't pay as you'll find today to insult an English peer. You're only Scottish half-wits, but I'll make you understand. You highland swine, these hills are mine. This is all Lord Brockett's land. Then up spoke the men of Noidot. Oh, we ain't shut your trap. For threats from a Saxon brewer's boy, we just won't give a rap. We are all ex-service men, and we fought against the Hun. We can tell our enemies by now, and Brockett, you are one. When he heard these words, that noble peer turned purple in the face. He said, these Scottish savages and Britain's black disgrace. It may be true that I've let some few thousand acres go to pot, but each one I'd give to a London spiff before another goddamn Scot. You're a crowd of tartan bolshies, but I'll soon have you licked. I'll write to the court of session for an interim interdict. I'll write to my London lawyers. They will understand. Oct! To hell with your London lawyers. We want our Scottish land. When Brockett heard these fighting words, he fell down in a swoon. They splashed his jowl with whiskey, and he woke up mighty soon. And he moaned, these dukes of Sutherland were right about the Scot. If I had my way, I'd start today and clear the whole damn lot. Then up spoke the men of Noidart, you have no earthly right. For this is the land of Scotland, it's not the Isle of Wight. When Scotland's proud Fianna with ten thousand lads is manned, we will show the world that Highlanders have a right to Scottish land. You may scream and yell, Lord Brockett, you may rave and stamp and shout, but the lamp we've lit in Noidot now will never go out. For Scotland's on the march, my boys, we think it won't be long. Roll on the day when the Noidot way is Scotland's battle song. Summit of the second Munro. <laughs> it's clear. It's... Oh my god. You look down the cliff and oh my stomach goes whoop, whoop. So I stayed with it and I look down and I calm myself. And then I noticed all the little plants growing right on the ridge. It's these little things of heather. That are so spiny, they look like monkey puzzle trees. Tiny monkey puzzle trees. Like the way the, the limbs of the monkey puzzle work. And you've got the spherical lichens, and you've got the red grasses. The sphagnum. They're all nestled in together, a riot of colours with veins of white quartz right up at the top here. White quartz at the top of these mountains. Just met a Monroe bagger called Helen. She's done 260. She's is very, very posh. Most people I'm meeting up here are posh or military English or. <laughs> and. Yeah, she was like, How many have you done? And I was like, Just complete my second just there. <laughs> Number one was an hour beforehand. I'm in no hurry, man. There's so much here. So much here. Far from home, born to roam. Oh, my God. Oh, I've reached my kayak. Oh, man. What a walk. What a fucking walk around the coast. Following deer paths a lot of the way, but deers can walk sideways along cliffs through low hanging trees. Uh, oh, it was so up and down.
been climbing over cliffs in the sea, hanging off birch trees and rubbing through myrtle and climbing through ferns and sphagnum moss, gullies, seeing paths beneath the plants that are like up to your chest, near to your chin height or over your head and you're pulling them apart and you're following the rob on the earth of deer and you're thinking, man, animals have been making tracks on this landscape for a long time, as long as these rocks have been here, not as long, but as long as these plants have been here, the whole landscape is shaped in a way by the pattern of feet, not all human at all, most of the paths most of the way the hillsides are tread, a trod, and the little bits that have allowed to become clagged with mud, or where the plants are more compact and barren, and you're able just to find this seam that runs across the landscape, through the landscape, along the landscape, with the landscape, in the folds of it. And the animals, you know, they take the easy route, which isn't always the obvious one. So a lot of the time's going high in order to get over obstacles that you can't even see at the time. And you just kind of got to follow that clambering path. Sometimes get off it. Have a look at things yourself. Yeah, they're a lot smaller than you, a lot of the animals that make the path, so... <laughs> Hi, my fox. You managed it. It's beautiful looking down at the sea at high tide, seeing all the uh, seaweed waving towards the sky. All these columns, these fucking strands of it. Bastard, is that a fucking tick? Hang on a second. What the fuck is that? Doesn't look alive. Looks like a fucking seed. Those are my balls. It's like a bit from an oat cake or something. I just swim in the river if I can check all that. Swim, there's a dip. Oh. D feeds out, I feed out. D feeds out, I feed out. D feeds out. I fade out, day fades out, I fade out. Recorded by Luke Winter and produced by Loris S. Sarid with funding from the Scottish Communities Climate Action Network. Very crack. Hey, I haven't seen a policeman on here. I've been here one and a half years and never seen one. So, you know, like, people can get up to what they want to get up to. But, you know, there's an unwritten rule in the community. It's if you do drink and drive, a lot of people do, uh, you can't, you've got to drive your car in first gear um, so that if you do crash, it's just yourself, you're injuring, um, you know, demolishing anything more significant. And then somebody else is like, the first thing you do, if you see somebody stuck in Noidart, first you get your phone to take a photograph. And then as soon as you've taken a photograph and posted it on Facebook, uh, in the Noidart group, you can go and help. <laughs> This road is beautiful. I have put links to Luke and Loris's other works in the episode notes. I would highly recommend you have a look. And again, if you have an idea for a podcast or written story uh, around community climate action and climate justice, please do get in touch about the Mini Grants. We support work in a variety of genres and formats, including creative and more factual stories, audio, writing, and more. Um, the email is stories at scottishcommunitiescan.org.uk. And until next time, take care of each other out there. Thanks 
Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please give it a like and maybe even a review. It will really help us reach a wider audience. If something exciting is happening in your own community, be sure to let us know so that we can help you tell your own story. Or maybe you would like to join our brand new Storyteller Collective. You can drop our Story Weavers a line at stories at scottishcommunitiescan.org.uk. To keep up to date, check out our website at scottishcommunities.org.uk or find us on Twitter, Facebook or Instagram. Or simply sign up to the newsletter. Thank you.